Uh, thank you all for coming, and thanks to the organizers for inviting me to speak here. It's my first time in Uruguay for mathematics, and it's been a real pleasure so far. So yes, this uh, work is joint with uh, Sang Hyun Kim from Seoul National University, who was here but just uh, left this afternoon. Great. So what we'd like to talk about is uh, well some structure of, of diffeomorphism groups of various regularities for some fixed manifolds in very low dimensions, so dimension one. So throughout, when I write M, this is either going to be uh, either the, the interval or the circle. And we're going to consider uh, the groups diff K of, of M and maybe some further interpolations between these where this is the uh, group of CK orientation preserving uh, diffeomorphisms. Okay. So uh, I'd like to involve uh, groups, geometry, and dynamics in this talk as much as possible. So I, I mostly do group theory myself, so that's one check mark. So uh, we're going to look at the, the interplay between algebra on one side and uh, analysis. So what I mean by these things is the, uh, here, the structure of groups of diffeomorphisms, in particular finitely generated or, or more generally countable groups of diffeomorphisms. And uh, here I mean, as suggested here, uh, regularity. And the, uh, the interplay here is mediated by the dynamics in some way. In the, uh, precisely, there is uh, dynamics which is forced by algebra. On the one hand. And on the, on the other hand, we have dynamical interpretations of regularity. Okay, so that's the general framework of what I'd like to talk about. So now maybe I'll say some specifics. So uh, the the invariant to a group of homeomorphisms that I'd like to consider is its critical regularity. So, so let G be a subgroup of the group of orientation preserving homeomorphisms of M. Generally, I consider this to be a countable subgroup. It need not be a priori, but for the most part, you should think of it as a countable one. And then we'll write CR of G, and maybe I'll decorate this with an M when it makes a difference, although generally it won't in this talk. Uh, this is going to be the, the critical regularity of G, and it's defined to be the supremum of the values of alpha such that G is realized as a subgroup of diff alpha of M. So a few remarks here are in order. So first, what is diff alpha? So here, if, if we write alpha is equal to uh, K plus epsilon, where K is the floor function of alpha, then uh, diff alpha of M 
means the uh, CK diffeomorphisms of M with uh, epsilon uh, holder continuous uh, kth derivatives. So that's what I mean then by uh, by defining this group diff alpha of M. Great. Uh, and okay, so, so and now this is going to be defined for any subgroup of of homeo plus of M. And what we'd like to do is to study it a little bit. So let me just remark. Uh, another thing about, uh, so th this is a supremum, so it, it may be extremely difficult to calculate unless it's sort of some known value that's somehow obvious. So what I mean by that is uh, you have examples of groups with uh, critical regularity equal to infinity which are, say, countable. So. For example, uh, if you look at uh, finitely generated torsion-free abelian groups, then you, it's very easy to have them act by C infinity to C infinity diffeomorphisms on any one of these manifolds. You can make, even make them act uh, analytically or uh, free groups. Uh, closed surface groups. Uh, for these, the critical regularity is, is just in infinity. And so, in, the, in, that in, in these cases, the studying this invariant isn't, isn't that interesting. So I'm going to be pr mostly interested in groups which have finite critical regularity. And part of the difficulty with that is uh, there are very, very few examples which are known uh, where, the uh, where the critical regularity is f both finite and something that we can write down. So let's give some background. So one of the categories of groups that we can think about uh, where critical regularity is something we can begin to at least explore in some reasonable way are uh, torsion-free nilpotent groups. So there's a theorem due to uh, Farb and Franks and independently by uh, Horkera, which implies that if N is, is finitely generated, torsion-free, and nilpotent, then this implies that N is a subgroup of diff 1 of M. So it can act faithfully by C1 diffeomorphisms of the interval and of the circle. And there's always uh, an upper bound on the critical regularity of a non-abelian torsion-free nilpotent group. And that comes from a more classical theorem of Plant and Thurston. And that says that, uh, so if, if N is, uh, is as here, torsion-free, uh, so let's say finitely generated, torsion-free, no potent, and uh, N is a subgroup of diff two of M, then N is abelian. In which case, its critical regularity will then be infinite. 
So uh, what the plant thurston theorem together with this theorem of Farb, Franks, and Horkera says that if you look at torsion-free non-abelian nilpotent groups, then they populate the interval between one and two in some way. And there are only two examples uh, for which the exact value of the critical regularity is known. So the first is a theorem of uh, uh, Castro, Horquera, and Navas. And so what they consider is the uh, Heisenberg group. So if, they, if you take H, which is just, which has this presentation. then they compute that the critical regularity of H is exactly equal to two. So this, uh, so what they proved in particular is that H embeds into diff two minus epsilon of M uh, for all epsilon greater than zero. <coughs> And uh, so in particular, uh, when I define critical regularity as a supremum, uh, this supremum may or may not be realized. And this is an example of a case where it's not realized. So if, if it were actually realized, then that would violate the plant thurston theorem. And the other known example is due to Horquera Navas Rivas. So they take N4, which is this group of nilpotent matrices, uh, of four by four uh, nilpotent matrices, so like this. And they prove that the critical regularity of N4 is exactly equal to 1.5. And it is unknown whether or not this critical regularity is realized or not. And so, <clears throat> uh, as you might be convinced now, uh, right, uh, to, if, you, if, you, I, if I hand you a group and I ask you, okay, this group is known to have finite critical regularity, what is the critical regularity? This is an extremely difficult problem. And one can oftentimes only give estimates. So let me tell you some general facts. Uh, I'm sorry, say that again? Is it what every here you need is a wrong two? Yes. Uh, this I don't, I don't, I don't know. I, th I would only put my, uh, so I, I, I don't know the exact answer. For that. Yeah, I, I, I would suspect that it works, works for all of them. Yeah. Okay. So the first general fact is, uh, is a result of Derouin, Klepsin, and, and Navas, which says that if, so if G is inside of uh, homeo plus of M and it's countable, then G embeds in uh, the group of, of uh, right, this is diff zero lip of M. So this is going to be the uh, group of bi Lipschitz homeomorphisms of M. 
And uh, so there's some sort of reasonable way now in which we can think of any countable subgroup of, of homeo of M as having critical regularity at least one, because it acts by uh, by Lipschitz homeomorphisms, which are, from many dynamical perspectives, they're, that's almost as good as differentiable, though they're not definitely, cannot always be realized by differentiable, uh, but by a, a differentiable diffeomorphism. So uh, Caligari gave the first example of a finitely generated group which acts faithfully by homeomorphisms on the circle, but does not act by diffeomorphisms. And then there's a, so the, there's a subtle uh, issue here passing between Lipschitz uh, regularities and sort of the next higher level of, of differentiability, which I'll address a bit later. But so this will, uh, I'll sort of take this as, as a given and a justification for saying that the critical regularity of any countable group of homeomorphisms uh, has critical regularity at least one. And then as far as regularity and its, uh, and its interplay with the structure of the group itself, so uh, this morning, Yash Loda told us about property T a little bit. So there's a theorem of Navas, which was then strengthened by uh, Bader, uh, Furman, uh, Gillander, and Monod, which said that, so if, if G uh, has property T, then its critical regularity acting on the circle is at most uh, 1.5. It's strictly less than 1.5. So now let's prove that it was less than or equal to 1.5, and these guys prove that it, ca that it can't be exactly 1.5. And as Yash had indicated earlier, that conjecturally, property T is an obstruction for groups to act at all in any interesting way on the interval around the circle. But this is uh, the state of the art here. And another interesting uh, relationship between critical regularity and algebraic structure of groups comes from another theorem of, of Navas, which says that if the critical regularity of G is greater than 1, then uh, G has either polynomial or exponential growth, which is to say that you, uh, if you have critical regularity above 1, then you have no groups of intermediate growth there, which is a so, and then groups of polynomial growth are always virtually no potent by a theorem of, uh, a famous theorem of, of Gromov. Okay. So those are general facts. And before trying to talk about more about specific values of critical regularities, let me give some more estimates for classes of, for various classically studied classes of groups. So the first that I'll tell you is if, if G is a, is a right angled Artin group, so that is to say it's defined by, you know, it has, you have some gamma, which is a, a, a finite graph, and the right angled Artin group A of gamma is given by, well, it's generated by the vertices of gamma, and then two vertices commute. if and only if they're connected by an edge. C 
so by uh, a theorem, so this is a, a very sort of classically studied class of groups inside of, uh, in, in, um, in geometric group theory, they, they form a nice uh, sandbox where you can explore conjectures about mapping class groups and other sort of uh, these cat zero groups and, and so on. And uh, these groups are always what are called residually torsion-free nilpotent, which means that every element in here that's non-trivial survives in a torsion-free nilpotent quotient of the ambient group. And so then uh, a, a, a strengthening of this theorem that I mentioned earlier of Farb and Franks and, and Horkera independently implies that A of gamma always embeds inside of diff one of M. And certainly sometimes A of gamma some embeds in C infinity diffeomorphisms of M. Uh, it, if gamma, for example, were a complete graph, then this group would just be abelian. If gamma had no edges, then this group would just be free. But then there's this en entire sort of spectrum of groups that's in between the abelian and free ones, and it's not clear how to analyze the regularity of actions there. And so combining some uh, results of Beck, Kim, and myself, and then Kim and myself as well, is that, so you, you either have either uh, the critical regularity of A of gamma is equal to infinity, or uh, the critical regularity of A of gamma is less than or equal to two. And this first conclusion happens only if A of gamma is isomorphic to a possibly trivial uh, direct product of other right-angled Artin groups, where each of these separately is a uh, free product of free abelian groups. So this is a, uh, a very limited uh, collection of these right angled Artin groups. So this is a, so most right angled Artin groups, again, populate the same stretch of the critical regularity spectrum as nilpotent groups do, somewhere between one and two. And uh, the people who study mapping class groups and their actions on the circle are sometimes interested in regularity of such actions too. And by one can show basically the same conclusion. So if, if S is an orientable surface and G uh, is inside of the mapping class group of S, which is, again, the uh, orientation-preserving homeomorphisms of S up to isotopy. And if this is here a, a finite index subgroup, then either the critical regularity of G is, is infinite, and this can only happen if S uh, at S is, is, uh, is homeomorphic to S11, so a, a torus with one boundary component, uh, and S0n, where here n is less than or equal to 4. So a sphere with four or fewer punctures. So this is, these are sort of sporadic surfaces, in which case the mapping class group is basically just a free group, possibly cross an abelian group. Or the critical regularity of G is again less than or equal to two. Okay, so yes. Uh, so it, just one is the is the lower bound. Yeah, that's that's the best that we can we can do. 
Yeah. So if you ask me any of these, if you, if you took any of these right angled art groups which have finite critical regularity and ask me to tell you the critical regularity, I have no idea. I don't even know how to guess. And so what I'll do instead is I'll, I'll reverse the question and I'll, I'll say, okay, give me a regularity and I'll give you a group which has that exact critical regularity. So to state the theorem precisely, let me just introduce a bit of notation. So I'll write a fancy G alpha, which uh, may or may not be decorated by, by an M, I, I won't for now when it's, when it's not gonna cause confusion, is going to be the class of uh, countable subgroups of diff alpha of M up to isomorphisms. These are just abstract isomorphism types of, of, of countable groups which occur inside of diff alpha of M. And so let me state uh, some version of the, the main result, and that is that, uh, so let, let alpha be in one infinity, then the collection script G alpha without union beta greater than alpha of script G beta contains a finitely generated group and a simple group. So in, in particular, this means that if I look at all countable groups with critical regularity exactly alpha, where alpha is realized, and there is a finitely generated group which satisfies, which, which falls into that, that class, and there is also a non-finitely generated simple group which falls in that class. <laughs> And here I'll just remark that here finitely generated, in ca the case of the interval, is five. And uh, in the case of the circle, we had to bump up the number of generators, but it's at most nine. And that's uniformly independent of alpha. And so there's one more conclusion. So. Remember when I stated these results about the critical regularity of certain nilpotent groups, there's an issue about whether the critical regularity is, is realized or not. So also, uh, the intersection beta less than alpha g beta without g alpha has the same conclusions. So this contains a finitely generated group and a countable simple group. So just to make sense, this has to uh, require some explanation when alpha is equal to one. Uh, so when alpha is equal to one exactly, what I mean here is that there exists a finitely generated group and a countable simple group which act by, by Lipschitz homeomorphisms on the interval and on the circle, but not by diffeomorphisms. Okay. Uh, so let me state some corollaries.
So one corollary is that uh, the critical regularity spectrum which is to say uh, the set of alpha is such that alpha is equal to the critical regularity of some, some group G is equal to uh, 1 infinity. So everything is possible. And another corollary uh, which goes into I guess the original reasons why uh, uh, these issues of, of regularity of group actions on one manifolds uh, play a, a played any role in geometry or topology is uh, about the smoothability of, of certain foliations. So uh, Tsuboy and Cantwell and Conlon had produced examples of, of foliations on, on closed three manifolds with various integer regularities which didn't admit any smoothings to higher integer regularities. And so what we can do is we can uh, give examples for non-integer non regularities as well. So the uh, particular, the, uh, the precise statement is as follows. So let alpha be in one infinity again, so some real number that lies in the critical regularity spectrum of groups. And let uh, y be a closed uh, orientable uh, three manifold with, so we need some sort of condition on it to guarantee the existence of of foliations and, and with which have surfaces uh, which are transverse to all the leaves uh, with uh, H2 of, um, of Y with coefficients in Z not equal to zero. Then there exists a codimension one foliation which is uh, uh, which is uh, C, C alpha, so its charts are, are uh, given by C alpha maps, and not which is not homeomorphic to a, uh, a union over beta greater than alpha of C beta foliations. So in particular what I mean by this is that there is, it's not even homeomorphic as a pair manifold foliation to a foliated manifold with a higher degree of smoothness of its leaves. So to give an idea of, of why you might believe something like this you start with maybe some C infinity foliation, codimension one foliation on Y, and you use some general results about three manifolds to say, well, okay, there's somewhere there's a, a surface, a closed surface of some sufficiently large genus, which is transverse to the foliation. And then you cut out a tubular neighborhood of it, and you replace uh, the, you, 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 can, you can use the action of pi 1 of that surface on the interval to, mo to modify that foliation inside of that tubular neighborhood in such a way that it becomes exactly a C alpha foliation. And then any homeomorphism from that new foliation to a C beta foliation for some beta larger than alpha would require a topological conjugacy between the surface group action on the interval and this n higher regularity surface group action on the interval and that is precluded by the, by the choosing of a s exactly C alpha critical regularity action. So these groups have something to do with the surface groups? 
Uh, right, so because these are all finitely generated groups of, of some u uniformly bounded number of generators, you can, you can say, okay, they're, they're, they're quotients of a surface group. Yeah, so I'll say a little bit more uh, about uh, the exact structure. Uh, one, one thing I'd like to say is um, about other moduli of continuity. So here we're looking at holder moduli of continuity for, for derivatives. But there are many more that one can consider. So if So if say omega from say zero infinity to, to uh, zero infinity is some concave function, then one can talk about omega continuity, which is defined by analogy to, to Holder continuity. So F is omega continuous if, uh, so this is, I'm considering this as a, maybe a, a real valued function on, on, the, uh, on the interval, if uh, F of X minus F of Y in absolute value is bounded by a universal constant c times omega of x minus y uh, for this is taken over x different from y. And so if omega were just say the function absolute value of x to the epsilon then this would just say that f is epsilon holder continuous. And so there's, there are actually many, many more examples of groups than are stated here in this theorem. It turns out that there's a, it, you can put a partial order on concave moduli of continuity and, and produce examples of groups which, sat, whose, which satisfy a, a weaker modulus of continuity, but not a stronger one. And that in particular says that not only is there one example in each of these, cl in each of these classes that I've defined here, but there are, in fact, uncountably many. So let me just uh, state that a little bit more precisely. So if, uh, if omega and mu are, are concave moduli of continuity, then uh, we can write, so there's a strict partial order. Uh, omega is much less than mu if this following technical condition holds, which is a little bit hard to parse at first. So, uh, right. so omega of this ratio of omega of x to mu of x tends to zero even uh, even when rescaled by this log to the k of 1 over x factor. So I mean, this is ju just a definition. It do it's, it's not too important to, to parse its exact meaning. But one, what one can actually prove a, is a strengthening of this theorem, which is as follows. So. Uh, so let k be a, a natural number 
and let um, mu be much larger than omega in, that, in this sense, there exists a finitely generated group Q, which depends on K and the modulus mu. And it's a subgroup of diff K mu of M. So these are CK diffeomorphisms whose K derivatives are mu continuous. Uh, such that, uh, actually, hold on, I'll, I'll write this just for the interval here for now, and that will become clear why in just a moment. Such that, first of all, the commutator subgroup of Q is simple, and every proper quotient Q is abelian, and second is that if omega is uh, is a concave mo is 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 um, is as above, then Q Q is not in script GK omega of M for M equal to I or S1. Right, so you have this strengthening of this theorem to, to basically, you produce this group of diff K mu con with K derivatives mu continuous group of diffeomorphisms of the interval where the commutator subgroup is, is simple and retains the same critical regularity as Q itself. And whereas here Q is only defined as diffeomorphisms of the interval, you have these, this critical regularity property holding for both the interval and the circle. And so in between any two uh, real uh, holder moduli of continuity, you can find an entire universe of sort of intermediate moduli where you have examples of all these possible critical regularities. And so in particular, that shows that each of these classes has infinitely many different, uh, uncountably many different distinct examples. Okay. So in the remaining two hours, I'll go into all the technical details. <laughs> uh, right. OK, so I'll just, let me just say a few words about some of the ideas that, that go into this. So what you need to do to have any hope of, of proving a theorem like this is to have uh, what I said earlier is a dynamical interpretation of regularity. So the mantra that one can, one can, pr one can state at least in, uh, in not so precise language and then maybe I'll state it in precise language is that uh, there exists, so uh, let's Let's say that um, their k is fixed and uh, mu is much greater than omega as in this, in this theorem here. Here secretly you can just consider alpha and beta where alpha is less than beta. So there exists a, an element f inside of diff k mu of, let's just say, i for now, which is, is faster than every element of 
diff k omega of i. So what on earth does that mean? So what that means is that so we, if I want to uh, write down examples of, of groups like this, I'm going to have to write down pretty explicit diffeomorphisms. And so how might I do that? Well, I'm going to have a sequence of disjoint intervals inside of the unit interval, which are getting smaller and smaller. And I'm going to, have, I'm going to build by hand, essentially, a diffeomorphism which moves points inside of that each, each one of those disjoint intervals to the right, or to the, maybe to the left, but let's just say to the right, some amount. And it turns out that the rate at, wi at which the points in these intervals get moved to the right compared to their lengths is intimately related to the regularity of the diffeomorphism you get. So, let me state the following sort of technical fact, which or there are really two technical facts, which, which make precise sense out of this, this uh, gobbledygook. So let, uh, so let k be an n, and let, so let delta be something between 0 and 1 fixed. And uh, mu a concave modulus. And let's let uh, j sub i be disjoint intervals in the unit interval. Uh, and n sub i inside of n, a sequence such that if I look at n sub i times j i to the k minus 1 times mu of the length of, of j i, and that this is greater than or equal to 1. Then there exists an f in diff k mu of i such that it satisfies the following conditions. So one is that the support of f is exactly equal to the union of the, these ji's. Uh, the second is that uh, if I look at f and I raise it to the n sub ith power, then this is what I would call delta fast on, uh, on ji. So what that means is that there is some point inside of ji that when I apply f to the ni to it, it moves it the fraction delta of the way across the interval ji. So, it is, so what's going to happen is that I have you know, a sequence of intervals like this, which are getting smaller and smaller. And now f to the n sub 1 moves a point here, say, 90% of the way across the, fir uh, across the first interval. And then f to the n2 takes a point inside of j2 and moves it 90% of the way across. And f to the n3 moves a point inside of J3, 90% of the way across it, and, and so on. And so to make sense of uh, faster than every element of diff k omega of i is the following, which I'll just state in words because I'm getting low on time, is that if instead you considered some diffeomorphism G, which has strictly higher regularity, so that is to say you increase the, the, uh, the strength of the modulus of continuity, say you, you 
replace mu by omega. And then you consider, say, g with the same exponents, n sub i. Then not only do you not move 90% of the way across each of these intervals when you apply g instead of f, you start to you, you move almost no, not at all. That is to say, outside of a subset of the, of the natural numbers of density zero, the limit of the percentage of the length of the interval you moved across divided by the length tends to zero. And so that makes that match for precise. So that's what I said at the very beginning. I had this arrow between dynamics and analysis. And this is a dynamical interpretation of regularity. OK. So then how does, uh, how does one then use this to, to prove a theorem like this? Well, what you can do is you start with some mystery group. I'll call it G plus. I'll tell you what G plus is in just a second. G plus is now going to act in two different ways on the interval. One is going to be a particular, uh, let's say, diff k mu action. So it's going to be the weaker modulus of continuity. And the other one, this is going to be an action that we build by hand. And this is one here, which is arbitrary, but of a higher regularity. So this is diff k omega. This one is prescribed. And this one is arbitrary. And so what we start out with is some element u inside of g plus, which is not the identity, and which has this magical property that its support is compactly contained inside of the union of the supports of all elements of g plus acting on the interval. So it, it has, some, in some reasonable sense, finite complexity. And so that allows us now to take some, some word here, u. And then we start iterating some conjugates. We take some conjugates inside of g plus and have them act here and here. So here u is again acting, but it's, here is something that we can prescribe. Here's something arbitrary. Okay, now we use this dynamical interpretation of regularity to say, OK, we're going to do some conjugates by elements of g plus here and stretch out the support of u. And here we apply the same conjugates and stretch out the support of u. And here we can measure how much the support gets stretched because we use sort of some pre-built diffeomorphism that we get from this theorem. And here we use the fact that any element of diff k omega moves points more slowly than our pre-built diffeomorphism in diff k mu. And so after some number of iterations, we get this element here, u, say, conjugated by some element g, which is going to depend on, on this action here, which, whose support is much larger than the corresponding support down here. And what this allows us to do, then, is to say, look, I can now conjugate by some further element to pull the support off of itself and take the commutator. And I get the identity because the supports are disjoint. And here, the support is much bigger. So if I, if I move over, the supports still intersect each other. And the commutator is not the identity. And so what that means, then, is I have 
some sequence of elements inside of G plus, well, and in some particular action of G plus on I by CK diffeomorphisms which are mu continuous, so that if I look at any our action whatsoever, at least one of those elements is going to be the identity under this action. And so no homomorphism from the image of this group here into this group can possibly be injective. And that's the, the basic idea. And I, I don't think that I can talk about uh, any more of the details right now in, in three minutes. Uh, maybe I'll just say a little bit about what U is. So G plus is, ends up being the group, uh, free group on two generators, free product with Baumslug Solitar 2, 1, or 1, 2, cross Z. So I said before for the interval you had five generators, so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, there they are. And it, one can now play with these, uh, with different actions of various regularities here using results of, of Gelman Luis, uh, Lius, sorry, and uh, Bonatti, Montverde, Navas and Rivas, I think. Yes. to say, okay, well, you can have reasonably good control of how elements of this group act on the interval if the regularity is, is at least, say, C1. And then one can play all sorts of games with commuting diffeomorphisms to say, okay, well, now, now I can build some word by hand so that if I look at any representation of this group, uh, into uh, diffeomorphisms of the interval which are at least C1, then this, so that this particular non-trivial element gets sent to a diffeomorphism whose support is a compact subset of the support of the group itself. Okay, so I'm going to stop right there. Yeah, it's it's some uh, it's some countable subset of the interval zero uh, between one and two, and I, I I don't know what it is exactly. So it's a as far as this critical regularity spectrum for Holder moduli, it's a very interesting question also to ask which regularities occur as uh, as critical regularities of finitely presented groups. Uh, I have very little idea of what. <coughs> what the answer there might be. It's, it's some countable subset, and I have no idea what it is. I don't, uh, we don't know of any examples of finitely presented groups with critical regularity strictly greater than two, which is also, uh, and finite ones. Yes? Your D plus, where the K and the mu enter in your construction of G plus? G, G plus is, is, is fixed. Uh, so, so, what, so when I have K and mu here, I have some, so what the, the group that's acting here is, is some phi, which is a phi of K mu applied to G. G plus is, is acting here. And this is, something that one builds directly. And this one is, is 
an arbitrary a action. So here the, the G plus is the is some group that we begin with. We build all our all the examples that, that, that we get are quotients of G plus. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, they're certainly not not, not faithful. Yeah. So yeah, right. So they're they're acting here by by this representation which we build depending on k and mu, and then we compare it to one which is arbitrary. Sorry, what? Uh, right, so uh, you mean you, you look little you? Yeah, yes. Yeah. Okay, so I'll write so support of say uh, so, so I wrote, wrote, that, wrote down phi or psi. So, so psi is going to be some arbitrary action to some diff of of m. What is, here goes whatever you want. So the support of psi is the uh, this is, by definition, the set of points x such that psi of g of x is different from x uh, for some uh, g in, in, in big G, OK? So this is an open subset now of, of the interval as I've defined it. And the property that u has is that if I look at the support of psi of u, and I look at its, its closure, then this is contained inside of the support of psi, which say this, the, the, is it the support of psi of u is compactly contained in the support of psi, independently of psi. And, uh, sort of one-third of the proof of the theorem is, is proving that such a u exists. <coughs> and it, it, it may not exist. Uh, okay, okay. it, it, it generally do, do, doesn't, doesn't exist for, for homeomorphism actions. Uh, one really needs some sort of a priori regularity to, to even begin to talk about it. <coughs> 